Hello there all, good evening to you wherever you are. I know it's evening in most places, um, but might be morning somewhere, you never know. And if it's morning, good morning to you. Um, you're live on Fire One TV, and uh, those on the radio, it is live as well. Um, please like us, follow us, and share, share, share. If you're on Facebook, um, please share this for us. We want this to really go far. Um, we are life one-on-one with um, a very dear friend a sister um, an attorney um, it is uh, domestic violence awareness month and so we want to talk about it saying no to domestic violence and it's really hurting a lot of people um, we're thankful we live in a country where um, laws have been passed um, that um, they do recognize when people go through that and the law fights for them. And I sure hope this will reach far and um, other countries will learn from the United States. I know other countries have it, but especially in Africa, we want change over there as well. Um, and thank God we live in the greatest country on earth and um, we have this privilege here and so i'm thankful um so we'll be discussing what domestic violence is because a lot of people go through that um especially immigrants go through that and without knowing that um it is really hurting their families um breaking homes um due to domestic violence so we have a lot to discuss today um please if you're on share make sure you share um it's really important if you love what we're doing and you love me please share for me thank you so much So, domestic violence affects both men and women. It's not only women, but the majority um, are the women. Um, but we want to talk about both of every race, religion, culture, and status. No matter who you are, no matter what color, uh, no matter what your ethnicity is, um, domestic violence does affect you. Um, in so many ways. It's not just about yelling or punching or black eye. Um, humiliation, stalking, manipulation, um, threat, and isolation are considered domestic violence. Um, it is really hurting a lot of people. So without wasting much time, I will introduce um, Mary as many, um, she is an immigration attorney, um, and she um, is is a Guinean American. Okay, yes. So um, let me say a little bit about her before I let her come on. Um, she's saying as a child of an immigrant from Ghana, West Africa, and a native of Brooklyn. She was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, say you to the New Yorkers. America can easily relate to different cultures and has an appreciation for the ethnic, ethnic diversity of her clients. Um, as the owner of As Many Law LLC, her passion is to empower and educate immigrants to become productive members of their community and achieve the American dream. Mary has assisted her client with immigrants and non-immigrant visas, citizenship, interview preparation, DACA, and green card application. Um, she has been pra practicing law for almost 15 years. Wow, that's really long. Well experienced um, with corporate, compliance and immigration laws. She is currently licensed in New York and New Jersey and can assist clients with immigration issues in any state. So no matter which state you live in, in all 50 states, she can assist you um, in any way. 
Um, she obtained her degree, law degree from Albany Law School of Union University in 2006 and a BA degree in political science from Boston University. Um, so no wasting much time, let me introduce Ms. Mary Yasmini. Hi, thank you so much. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you today? Really good and happy new month. Um, being um, a month raising awareness and advocating against um, domestic violence, I'm really pleased to have you on here. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join you. That is awesome. Um, <laughs> so, um, somebody might ask, I already said a lot, but I know you might have a little bit to put in or more to pitch in. Um, what is domestic violence and what causes <laughs> that and what are the signs when um, somebody is being abused without knowing? Right, so when we think of domestic violence in the general context, we usually think of physical or verbal abuse, um, you know, uh, being hit or um, yelled at, being put down. Um, that's how we generally think of domestic violence. You also mentioned stalking, when someone's being aggressive, showing aggressive behavior towards you. All these kinds of things can be considered domestic violence. Um, but I feel like when we talk about domestic violence in the immigrant context, mm -hmm. there are a few other things that are unique to the immigrant experience as it relates to domestic violence. Great. Um, so, um, what kind of law do you practice? Um... Okay, yes, yeah, so as you stated, I do practice immigration law, and basically I assist people with helping them to get their green cards, um, if they want to apply for citizenship, if they want to file applications for their immediate relatives, uh, maybe they've already filed applications and they need assistance with responding to um, immigration notices, um, you know, requests for more evidence, or if maybe their case has been denied and they need help with an appeal, we can assist them with that as well. Okay, that's really good. Um, so, uh, how did you become involved in immigration law? Um, is it something that you're passionate about, or um, just because you're uh, born of an immigrant, you decide to pursue that? Yeah, so that's really interesting. I actually started my legal career um, doing something totally different than immigration, right? I used to work for uh, a small uh, insurance company. I was in the private sector handling mainly contracts, policies, um, consumer complaints, uh, putting policies and procedures in place for the company. So it was a totally different experience. However, um, a few years into my legal practice, I relocated to Ohio for family reasons, and I was connected with a local attorney here in Ohio who mentored me in immigration law. So that's pretty much how I got connected into immigration law. But um, I feel that, you know, being that I am a child of immigrants from Ghana, West Africa, uh, even though it was totally two different areas of the law, it was sort of a natural and easy transition for me, being that, again, that, you know, my parents are from Ghana. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. New York is the melting pot, as they say, of so many different cultures. Um, so, you know, it was, it's... It was pretty a uh, good comfortable fit because I'm used to being around different cultures, different ethnicities, and I definitely have a high respect and appreciation for the immigrant experience because it's such a big part of my life. Well, that's awesome. Um, uh, it seems like America is an immigrant country. Um, everybody's from somewhere, and I like the diversity and the culture. Like you meet you meet everybody from different country, and it, it, it really blends in and. Um, I see that as, let's see how to picture heaven, how heaven will be like. Mm -hmm. So it's not yes, like, all only, yeah. yes. so not only like one walk of life, but you hear different stories, um, different walk of life, how people grow up. So that is really good um, to know. Um, so um, what should someone do if they're um, in an abusive situation? Right. So before that, I think I want to step back a little bit to describe a little bit more how domestic violence appears within the immigration context. Mm -hmm. Right. So typically, like I said, um, when you think about abuse, you think about it maybe physical or verbal abuse, right? And generally, mm -hmm. but 
this, I feel like immigrants face a special challenge when it comes to domestic violence because of their status, right? They may be documented, Mm -hmm. have legal papers, or may not. Mm -hmm. And those status challenges um, pose an extra barrier, an extra challenge when it comes to domestic violence and immigration. So I'm going to talk about three ways that this can manifest itself in the immigrant experience. So one way is isolation, right? I see this many times with my clients. Um, they'll be married to someone um, or have an intimate partner relationship and the partner, the abuser isolates them from getting to learn English, right? They're in a new environment and a new culture, a new land. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, the abuser will try to keep them isolated, um, try to keep them from learning English, learning a new language, learning about the new culture, learning about you know, the laws and procedures that we have here in America. Yep. So they'll isolate them, keep them from family and friends, mm-hmm. um, keep them from making new friends, you know, won't let them integrate into society fully because they want to assert that control and power over them yeah. so that they won't be able to get out of the situation that they're currently in. So isolation is a big factor that we see in the um, immigrant experience, and it's very debilitating because here you are, you're in a new country, mm-hmm. you don't really know what the law, culture, yeah. or anything is about, and yeah. you feel trapped. Mm-hmm. You don't know who else you can trust. Maybe it's only your um, intimate partner or your spouse that you can trust, but yet they're the ones who's exerting this tool of isolation and power and control over you. Mm-hmm. So it can be a very, um, very vulnerable situation in that context. Another way that we see domestic violence um, within the immigrant experience is through uh, threats and intimidation, right? Yep. So a lot of times we'll see that... Um, usually the U.S. citizen or the green card holder, the person that does have legal status, they will either refuse to file immigration papers for Mm -hmm. their spouse, they will refuse to, maybe they file the application, but then they refuse to follow up with it, they refuse to appear for um, interviews, Mm -hmm. which can be, uh, you know, that can spoil the whole case if you don't show up for the So they use, they would use those um, means as a threat to mm-hmm. control the pe- person, to manipulate the person, to do, to get the person to do what they want to do. They will use those threats and intimidation as a source of control yeah. um, to hold it over the, the significant the other, over the spouse. And that can be, again, very um, challenging and debilitating because it's like your whole life is lies in the hands of this one yep. individual. Yep. Right? Yeah, depends on that. Uh-huh. control and power over you. you. You don't know what to do. Hmm. Another way that we see this, and this is the last um, example that I'll give, is financial as well as family uh, manipulation and control. So sometimes we'll see that, uh, again, in addition to not allowing the person to learn English or integrate into culture and society, they won't allow them to work, right? Mm -hmm. um, And it's not by choice. It's not something that, you know, both partners came to a conclusion, well, you know, it's, it's the best situation for our family if only one person works. No, this is... Um, with no reasonable justification. They refuse to allow the person to work. They want to keep them home, keep them isolated. Um, And then it's also a means of controlling them financially. So if this person has no means to support themselves or means to get income, they're totally reliant and dependent on the abuser. And again, the abuser uses that as a source of control and manipulation on the victim. Um, Another way we can see this is uh, the 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 abuser themselves sometimes they will um, threaten to take away the children yeah. right if there's children involved in mm-hmm. the family and the in the home um, they'll threaten to file for custody and say well you know the judge will never give you custody you don't even have legal status here or they'll automatically award them to me because I'm you know I have I have my papers yeah or something I have legal status and you don't. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it, again, it's a source to control and manipulate, um, and manipulate the survivor and the situation. Okay. Um, and you know, I don't practice a uh, family law, but I've had clients in that situation and it's not true. The judge is not automatically going to side with the U S citizen or with the green card holder, holder. um, just because they have legal status. No, there's a, a myriad of things that uh, the judge take into consideration mm-hmm. before they decide to award custody to either parent. Um, so if that's you and you're in that situation where you feel like, you know, 
I don't have, um, you know, who will fight for me? I don't have any sort of standing even mm-hmm. in court to go to court. Um, don't let that trap you to keep you in an abusive situation because of that, because it's, it's not true. Um, another way that I've seen this where the, the abuser would use and try to use the children or family members to control mm-hmm. um, the victim is that they'll actually kidnap the, the children. Right. They'll take them away internationally, take them back home, take the children and say, you know, you'll never see your children again. Um, And knowing that the victim themselves may not be in a position or may not be willing to travel back home because of their immigration. Yeah. So, again, another tool to keep the the vicious cycle of abuse. Um, They use it as a tool to perpetuate the abuse. The abuse. Unfortunately. Okay. Um, so, um, in the context, uh, since October is a domestic violence awareness month, um, why is this important or relevant to immigration? Yeah, so like I just explained, I feel like um, a lot of times when we think of October, we think of breast cancer month, which is also mm-hmm. a very worthy cause. Um, but domestic violence is definitely an issue that is rampant within our community. Um, it touches many different areas of society, it doesn't matter if you're rich, you're poor, <laughs> educated, uneducated, yeah. uh, your race. I've seen, I have many different clients in, uh, of, from many different countries, mm-hmm. Iran, Pakistan, um, Bangladesh, India, uh, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, all throughout the world. It, domestic violence is something that's pervasive um, and it touches a lot of different individuals. It transcends a lot of different barriers and it seems as if it's um, taboo almost to talk about <laughs> right? yeah. culture within our home environment. Um, people don't like to, to, to talk, talk about, about it. Yeah. For so, various reasons. Okay. So, um, would you say the abuse, I, I understand it's a little bit by punching or beating or but like some go through like emotionally, can there be like an emotional abuse that would that be like yes. considered like a uh, domestic violence? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, in the context of a lot of times we see it manifest itself as verbal abuse, things that are said to you that will affect you psychologically, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are said to you to keep your self-esteem low, to keep you manipulated and in 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 a sense or in a state of depression so that you don't even have the will to fight for yourself. You know, psychological abuse and warfare is very real and considered a part of domestic violence. Absolutely. So if there's somebody listening or somebody out there who is an immigrant and, and let's say they don't have a good status and they're going through because some of the abuse, like you won't, you won't see marks on their body, but they're going through that emotional because I, a lot of people go through that. Um, mm-hmm. What would you advise them to do? Right. So I would advise anyone um, who has experienced any kind of abuse, whether it's verbal, physical, psychological, emotional abuse, to reach out to someone for help, right? You have to break the cycle of silence because that's what the abuser wants. He wants to keep you silent so that you can't help yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And like you stated in the beginning, fortunately, we live in a country where people and individuals are afforded rights, um, afforded rights to help themselves. They have the freedom to live abuse-free, right? Not to live in a state of oppression and Mm -hmm. depression. Mm -hmm. And if, if you do find yourself in that situation, The first thing I would say, again, is to reach out for help, Um, especially if it could become a matter of life and death. The first point of contact, usually I would say, would be the police, but I know a lot of immigrants are fearful um, and reluctant to Mm -hmm. reach out to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Again, some of that goes back to what they've been told by the abuser themselves. You know, the police is going to arrest you. They're going to deport you. The police will never help you. But you'd be surprised. A lot of the police departments, they actually have whole units, you know, dedicated to domestic violence victims because they see the need in the community and actually they want to foster um, that relationship within the community so that people will be more willing to reach out when it comes to issues of domestic violence. So the first thing I would say is to reach out. Um, If you're not comfortable reaching out to the law enforcement, the police department, reach out to someone that you trust. Mm -hmm. So that could be anyone being from uh, your pastor, a social worker, the doctor. There's so many people in positions of authority that um, may have resources to link you to other people who can help you. 
Um, another thing that I would definitely recommend is, and I think you just put it up there, it's the National, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Mm -hmm. They have tons of resources. It's a national organization, and they can uh, connect you to resources within your local area where you are. Oh, sorry about that, my bad. <laughs> Go on, please. <laughs> Okay, yeah, no, absolutely. So I definitely think, you know, that the National Domestic Violence Hotline um, an organization is a, a great resource that you can connect to that so that they will be able to connect you to local resources in your area. But I think the most important thing is to reach out for help. Don't stay in an abusive situation because it could mean your life. That is true. It destroys home. It destroys family. Um, never be afraid. You might be an immigrant who don't have a status, but if you know within your heart that you're going through any, you're in any abusive um, relationship or situation, reach out to somebody. Um, being that um, sometimes I wouldn't say friend because some friends tends to stop you in the back. Um, it's good if you have a trust. A trusty or trustworthy friend yes you can talk to them but if you're in a community and you join a church talk to your pastor talk to your doctor reach out to a social worker or even if your kids go to school you can talk to them because the I know they provide social worker services in the schools and they can lead you to a lot of different resources or look for an immigration attorney and you can talk to them um, like someone like Miss Mary as many she's yes, really good um, so would you tell uh, viewers and listeners where you're based Oh, sure. So I'm currently based in Columbus, Ohio. Um, but as you mentioned, I can represent individuals on any state. So uh, if you're in Texas, Utah, California, you can just reach out to me and we can take it from there. Okay. And um, how can they reach you um, if they want to? Uh, I think your number is on the screen or your contact. Uh, yes. Uh, for absolutely. our listeners on the uh, radio. The <laughs> The best way to reach me is actually via email or um, you can schedule an appointment via the Calendly link um, so that you can book an appointment directly or you can also contact my office and leave me a message as well. Okay. Um, so would you tell our listeners your number, um, those on the radio? Because it's uh, both ways. It's live on um, the TV and the radio at the same time. So. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So my office line is 614-300-5994. Or um, you can feel free to email me at mary at um, And I also have some information on my website. Uh, so you can also visit there, www.assumingingblog.com. Well, that's good. Um, before I let you go, um, let's say um, this year has been quite an interesting year. Um, <laughs> if... I don't know if somebody predicted it or somebody planned that we were going to be where we are right now. I wouldn't have believed it. Um, but with COVID and everything, how has that affected um, immigration proceedings and all, all the other stuff? Yeah, so uh, COVID definitely took everyone for surprise, even within the immigration world and context. Um, uh, for instance, we see that, you know, Things were basically shut down. The mm -hmm. Borders, uh, flights were canceled. Um, people were stuck in different places, in different states, different countries, um, not able to move. Um, good thing some of that is reopening right now. But um, I think the major thing was that a lot of the interviews, um, appointments were uh, canceled because the immigration offices were canceled. Everyone was just- They, they don't want no COVID, right? <laughs> right, totally on lockdown. However, um, recently, uh, since July, I believe, um, offices have since reopened mm -hmm. um, and they have instituted a myriad of uh, COVID protocols. So, you know, when you go to the interview, you make sure you have your mask, a uh, limited amount of people are uh, allowed into the interview site. Um, those are some things that USCIS has implemented and put into place. Um, during the COVID crisis, though, they also um, extended deadlines for people to respond to applications or to respond to notices from immigration. Mm -hmm. They also um, allowed people to be more flexible in rescheduling interviews due to COVID. So mm -hmm. immigration has done their part to try to keep <laughs> the wheels turning. It's turning slowly, but there's things are back in action right now. Wow, that's good. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I 
No, go on. I was, I was sorry. I would also say uh, uh, one question that I've been getting from a lot of clients since COVID has happened is whether or not they should travel, uh, which is a very a hot topic right now and a very great question. Um, and particularly people that have current pending applications, mm -hmm. um, it's, I would say it's really um, important for them to consider whether or not they should travel. And in my opinion, I've been telling clients that if you do not have to travel at this point in time, especially with the pending application, that you should not travel. Mm -hmm. Even if you have an approved travel document or parole document, because at the end of the day, the way things are with COVID, um, no one can really control if there's another shutdown, if borders are shut down, if um, flights are canceled, and you don't want to get stuck in another country while your application is pending mm -hmm. here. So I would say, you know, be very cautious about traveling with the pending application. Um, again, we do know that there's issues of life and death, but I would say that you need to take all those things into consideration so that you're not caught um, in a situation you don't want to be in. Exactly. Um, so viewers and listeners, if you do have a question, you can um, give us a call. Um, we'll be here for another five, ten minutes um, with Miss Mary. Um, if you do have a question, please call. And if you're on Facebook and you want to um, send questions through comments, you can do that as well. Um, our phone lines are open if you're within the United States. I think it will be right here, but I open both lines. We have a WhatsApp line and a regular line. Um, 303-800-6277-303-800-6277 and our WhatsApp line is 720-238-1489 720-238-1489 um, so what advice would you um, kind of um, give immigrants because um, I don't know everybody's status is different and filing and process are different and a lot of people live in fear um, of knowing when the, um, they're trying to take a step forward things might not work out the way they see things so what advice would you give to immigrants um, especially Africans I should say because a lot of them are really timid and like the bullying and the fear of being sent back to I wouldn't use a word that don't want to go out uh, send back home. What would you say to them? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, I would go back to saying that you have to speak out. You have to reach out and break the cycle of silence. Um, and I hope this would encourage people to know, to help them to break the cycle, to know that there are actually immigration options for you that are available to you if you are, in fact, a victim of domestic violence. Um, one... Uh, application that immigration has put into place is the Violence Against Women Act, the VAWA application, which is available to spouses and children um, of um, U.S. citizens or green card holders. Another uh, potential form of relief or another application that someone can file if they're in an abusive situation is actually a U visa. Uh, U visa is actually for a victim of any crime, not actually not any crime, but there are certain specific crimes such as theft, robbery, rape, assault, um, but domestic violence is one of the eligible categories of a crime which in which someone can apply for a U visa. Um, the U visa does have different requirements um, and a different quite a bit, bit of a different process. So um, my advice would be again to reach out, um, definitely talk to an immigration attorney so they can walk you through um, the merits of your case, assess the strengths of your case, assess to see how it would be the best way to um, put together your case so that mm. it would be a strong enough case um, in immigration uh, as far as your immigration application. Um, you know, now is not really the time to go it alone and do it on your own because mm. the risk of a denial is great. It's too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in these days, in this immigration environment, in this context, a denial can actually mean deportation. And so I would say definitely reach out to an immigration lawyer, a professional. Okay, Ms. Murray, we have our first you. caller on the line. Hello? Okay. Hi. Um, I just wanted to... Ask um, please, your name and where are you calling from? Uh, my name is Quincy. I'm calling from New York. New York. Okay. Yes. And please go on. Um, I want to find out uh, if there's somebody that's going through a problem right now 
in terms of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, what, what should it do? Should it go to a shelter? Should it call the cops? I mean, what are we supposed to do now? Uh, okay, so what kind of, are they being thrown out of the home or? Um... Yeah, the situation is really, really bad. And uh, within the African community, we can't even talk about it. You can't. Um, so I think, okay, do you want to check that, Mary? Sure. So I would say if this is a situation of um, direct physical violence, maybe a matter of life and death, to definitely reach out to the police department if you can, um, so that you can also make a report and that that will also serve as evidence later um, to help bolster your case. If the individual is not comfortable reaching out to law enforcement, I would definitely say, again, reach out to local resources in your community, such as a shelter. Um, they will be able to put you in touch with other resources um, to help you find uh, legal assistance, to help you find an attorney, to help you maybe with your immigration case or to get custody or to file for divorce, whatever legal issues that person may be in need of, whether it's also um, filing for uh, order protection. You know, a lot of the shelters, they have legal centers or they have relationships with local attorneys in the community who can help um, people who are victims of domestic abuse. All right. Um, are you still on there, Mr. Kwesi? Okay, I think maybe he's listening on, um, on the radio. Okay, let's go on. Sure. Okay, um, so just like that same question, um, I know everybody's case is different, and um, you know, I'll say, I'll speak on, on behalf of Guineans, Guineans talk a lot, so um, maybe somebody went through an immigration um, proceedings and theirs weren't different, and somebody mm -hmm. is taking a step, but they will say a lot of stuff to discourage that person not to move forward with their plans. Um, what would you say on that and advice to um, all Guineans? Yeah, unfortunately, that is um, quite unfortunate in that situation because people do talk, right? And mm -hmm. A lot of times when they talk, maybe they had a bad experience, or yeah. maybe their circumstances of their particular situation was mm -hmm. unusual, mm -hmm. right? Their facts were not favorable. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just be cautious about listening to other people, how their cases went, how their friend or a friend of a friend's case went. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times facts can get mixed, uh, distorted or um, the true facts are not revealed. Exactly. So I would say definitely reach out on your own and talk to a legal professional to get advice on your specific case. Do not rely on Friends. the advice of other people. Mm -hmm. Do not rely on how other people's cases turned out. That is good. Um, <laughs> I think I'm done. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity um, to come on and speak to your viewers and your listeners about domestic violence. As you stated, it is something that is very prevalent mm -hmm. um, throughout society and within our community. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's very taboo. But I would just want to um, urge and employ all of your viewers and listeners to reach out, break the cycle of silence because it's not worth risking your life. It's not worth, you know, us turning on the TV and hearing about someone being shot or, you know, murdered or killed. It's, it's, it's not worth it. It's not worth your life. Break the silence and reach out. Mm. Um, there's opportunities and there's resources for you. Okay. That is good. Thank you so much. Um, but before we go, um, with this new um, rules and other regulations that are going on with um, visas, uh, are they lifted? The, the, the temporary ban, um, that visas are not being issues um, for um, people that want to come to the United States. Um, is this still in place? Yes, unfortunately, um, those particular visas, those bans on new visas being issued are still in place. Hopefully, things will be lifted soon. Um, I know that consulates have opened up abroad, um, but even that is, you know, with restrictions and limitations. So if you are abroad, I would just say keep in touch with your local consulate. Mm. 
Mm. And what families that want to file for their families home, like they have um, the citizens or green card, can they still go ahead and do that? Or theirs has been a, as well? Uh, it depends. If you're currently here in the U.S., um, local, uh, the USCIS is currently still processing applications if you're here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Consulate applications, though, may have some restrictions based on the consulate. Oh, all right. Well, good to know. Miss Mary, mm -hmm. well, thank you for your time today. And I sure hope in the future when we need you, you'll come back. And I didn't know this is the first time here, but we'll bring you back because I know a lot of Guineans and a lot of immigrants from other country have a lot of, a lot of questions um, to ask. But if you're watching or if you're listening, um, please do well to reach out to Miss Mary if you need help with any immigration questions, um, need help with filing um, for green card, um, any kind of immigration help, reach out to her. Her number is on the screen. All the information is on there. If you're on the radio and um, you want her contact, you can reach out to her here at Fire One or you can um, visit her website at Um You can get her there as well. Um, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you too. Have a good night. You too. Okay, so this brings um, us to the end of our broadcast today. Um, we'll be back tomorrow with a midweek broadcast um, back on election 2020 Ghana, um, December 2020. Um, we have a lot to discuss tomorrow, so please join us tomorrow here right on Fire One TV um, at 3.30 p.m. Mountain Time. That will be 9.30 in Ghana. God bless you and stay safe, stay blessed. Thank <laughs> you.